Welcome to the latest printed press. I'm Aisha and Jamal, and we are again um, on our special episode focusing on young Cypriot professionals in our Turkish Cypriot community and their successes. And I'm very happy today to have Ertan Karpazlı, who is currently the editor of Radio East Med and has been working in journalism for many years. Welcome, Ertan, to the program. Thank you very much for agreeing to come on. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. Um, you know, you are a very experienced journalist. And um, like I said, you're currently working for Radio East Med. So obviously you're a real uh, shining beacon in our community. So I thought it'd be great for you to come on and talk about, you know, how you got into the profession and give some advice uh, to people out there that perhaps want to get into the same profession. But first of all, before we start on anything specific, would you be able to tell us about yourself and what you do? Um, okay, well, I'm Ertan Karfasler. Um, I'm born and raised here in London, East London, Walthamstow. And um, my mum is originally from Afgalia. Um, today is known as Kurtulus in uh, North Cyprus. Um, but she was actually born here as well. Okay. Um, my dad is from Chatos, um, today known as Serdalde. Um, he moved over to the UK in the 80s um, after he married my mother. Um, and yeah, I've been born and raised in East London. Um, I went to school there. Um, I finished university in Middlesex University. And um, yeah, right now I'm just, um, I've started my own news platform, which focuses mainly on um, geopolitical developments in the Eastern Mediterranean, hence why it's called uh, Radio East Med. Uh, not Radio East Med, as a lot of Turkish Cypriots uh, mispronounce. <laughs> um, East Med is an abbreviation of Eastern Mediterranean. Yes. Um, so I started that at the beginning of this year. Um, it's um, it's a side project, really. It's not it's not really my job. It's something that I'm just doing in my spare time. Um, I'm doing it with the intention of, um, first of all, raising awareness um, for the Turkey Cypriot community about geopolitical developments in our region, and um, secondly, also I'm doing it. I'm I'm targeting mainly um, geopolitical uh, risk analysts um, who are, you know, looking for investing in the region. And it's just to kind of keep them informed about, um, you know, the risks of potential investments and conflicts that may arise and um, things like that. And um, I haven't monetized the project yet, but I hope that within a year, um, hopefully with the support of the Turkish Cypriot community, I'll be able to you know, get some sponsors, some investments and, and make it into something a bit more professional. Mm, fantastic. It all sounds really brilliant. And um, we're going to sort of go maybe more into more detail with that a bit later on as to what, um, you know, uh, motivates you to do that. But um, mm -hmm. could you tell us generally, you know, you're a journalist, what sparked your interest in getting into your career at the beginning? Well, I think for me, um, when I was 15, um, going to Kelmscott School in Walthamstow, I had um, an English teacher. I remember his name, actually. His name was Mr. Mogridge. And he was the first teacher that really got through to me when it comes to um, how to use language to create art, really. So I was really fascinated from um, by the way you can use language um, since that age. So I wasn't focused on journalism from the onset. I was more focused on poetry, script writing, screenplays, mm -hmm. and that kind of stuff. But um, as I got older, um, my my interests kind of evolved. And um, when I was 18, I enrolled at Middlesex University in a creative writing course and completed my undergraduate in that in that field and with a 2-1. Um, so, yeah, like really from there, I just I, I took a, a few journalism modules and I realized, you know, this was kind of where I'm going at. Um, but at the same time, I never actually had the self-belief, unfortunately, at that age that I would actually make it as a journalist. So even though it was my passion, um, I held off pursuing it. Um, so it was, I think, when I was, um, I moved to Turkey, actually, for a while. I was living in Turkey for nine years. So after I was, I think I was 23 when I moved out there. And um, while I was 23, I was just, I was just like enjoying myself. I, I enrolled in um, a few courses there. Um, I got a few, like, you know, part-time jobs as a, a tour guide and things like that. Um, but in terms of becoming a journalist in Turkey, that wasn't an option at the time because um, English language media at the time was not 
really a thing in Turkey. Um, it was mainly in Turkish and my Turkish wasn't, I, I don't think still, it's not really good enough for me to work as a journalist. Mm -hmm. um, but it was actually when I had a friend of mine who um, he, he met uh, another Turkish person who had graduated from Oxford University. And um, he had come back uh, to Turkey since graduating. And my friend um, invited me to accompany him to a dinner party at this, this person's house. Um, so I just went along for the free food, to be honest with you. Um, I had no idea who I was, who I was meeting. So um, I went there. Um, we had dinner. I enjoyed everyone's company. Um, and obviously, the person who was hosting us, he asked me where I'm from. I said, I'm originally from Cyprus. And um, I didn't tell him really much else about myself. He didn't tell me much else about himself. So I just ate and I left and I didn't think anything of it. But funnily enough, um, this person, um, after I'd left the party, he suddenly got interested. He wanted to learn about Cyprus. So he just started um, typing Cyprus into Google, finding whatever, whatever was out there. And um, I had recently started a blog, actually. So I was just, I'd written maybe two or three articles for the blog and that was it. And one of them was about Cyprus. And that happened, that article happened to turn up on his, on his search. Wow. So, um, yeah, he, he read the article and he was really impressed by it. So he's like, okay, who's the author? Mm -hmm. So when he looked at the author's name, he realized that it was the same person that was in his house just a few days earlier having dinner. So he immediately called me um, to, you know, um, I exchanged, we exchanged numbers and he gave me a call and he said, you know, thank you for the article. It was very informative. Then he told me that his father was actually the um, managing director of a news agency in Turkey. And this news agency had a platform, a World Bulletin. And um, they were doing news about the region, news about Turkey in the English language. Um, and they were looking for uh, somebody who knows English as a, as a native speaker to um, edit articles for their website. So um, he immediately called me. Um, he introduced me to his dad. And then his dad introduced me to um, a very famous Turkish journalist called uh, Akif Emre, who um, oh. unfortunately passed away about three years ago. He was the um, head um, editor-in-chief of World Bulletin. And um, literally within two weeks, I was I was hired. I started a job there. And um, yeah, just from there, I just grew, really. Yeah. So that was your break into your career, was it, yeah. do you think? Or yeah. do you think more things yeah. happened after that that you could tell us about? That there were, um, the, you know, were things, in the career ladder. There were things that were happening in my life um, that made me get more interested in news and made me get more interested in geopolitics. In 2013, um, just before I got the job at World Bulletin, actually, I was in Egypt um, over the summertime. I spent the summer there, um, a couple of months, um, just to learn some Arabic. And um, while I was there, a military coup happened. Um, so there was a lot of instability. Um, the, the military coup was very, how can I say, it was very intense. Um, I had gun battles taking place um, on the street where I was living. And we had to sit away from the windows because bullets were just flying everywhere. Um, and actually, I remember that time very clearly because I didn't want my mum to worry. Um, my mum's not usually the type of person who follows the news, and she was um, in Cyprus. Um, so um, I had no intention of leaving Egypt. I was doing my thing there. So long as I'm careful, uh, nothing's going to happen. And um, for about a week, she was calling me nearly every day. And... Yeah. There were gunshots on the streets outside. And she's like, what's that sound? What's that banging sound in the background? And I told her it's just fireworks. Um, and then about a week later, she realized what was happening in Egypt. One of her friends told her. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, that was a very interesting time for me. And um, like I got to kind of observe certain dy dynamics in, in a conflict situation that I wouldn't have observed otherwise. Yes. And um, it got me interested about, you know, what's what's happening in this region? Mm. Um, how is it affecting me? Um, you know, a few times m myself and my friends out there, when we were walking down the street, we almost got beaten up because we were Turkish. But we didn't understand why is that an issue? Because a week before the coup happened, mm. people, people in Egypt were loving Turkish people. And then after the coup yeah. happened, suddenly 
Turks are like the number one enemy. So, um, okay. and we didn't, we didn't understand what, what changed in one week. So we, I started to see that there are certain dynamics in the region, um, in Cyprus, in Turkey and beyond, that whether we like it or not, it affects us. It affects our position in the world. And um, I wanted to kind of understand that. And I wanted to, um, first of all, understand it and then start teaching other people. So that's, I think, really what made me really consider getting into journalism yeah, for a full-time cool. basis. Well, I mean, you had some amazing personal experiences, obviously a little bit scary as well, but mm. certainly very um, inspiring that you amidst all of that and you didn't obviously fear it. You were actually interested in, you know, finding out about the politics and you stayed um, in a country. I mean, Egypt is quite a difficult place still currently unfortunately there's always a lot going on there so the fact that you know you took that upon yourself at a very young age um, is very commendable really I mean you know people talk about struggles in life but you sort of delved into the deep end there we've got a, a comment from Michaela saying well done amazing story we should always pursue our dreams insecurities are temporary write a book we need more Turkish Cypriot people coming forward this is so inspiring i mean i think so definitely ertan obviously through your uh uh radio uh uh east med and your podcast obviously you're sort of making our community more aware of the issues around that region but certainly <laughs> obviously i know that you're a journalist and you write many articles and i think obviously um informing our community is a very um you know, very important thing that you're going to have to do, I think, for us in the future. Mustafa mm -hmm. Qureshi, and you're part of the Jezire um, Derne as well, aren't you, together, has said, proud mm -hmm. of my brother, Ertan Karpazla, mashallah. Um, it's nice when people come on and support you, but obviously this doesn't come out of thin air, does it? You know, you build these relationships and these solid friendships because of your loyalties and your integrity, really. And I've noticed that about you, Ertan, that you are very, you know, uh, set in your sort of morals and I think that's why people warm to you and um, believe in you, because that's another thing with journalism is that, you know, more, more times than not, you don't really believe in what you hear on the news. So I think the fact that you're quite an honest and open person is quite commendable for the profession that you do, you know. But if we move on now, what obstacles and challenges did you face in your career? Well, um, when I entered journalism, I was quite naive. Um, and they say something about if you want to work in the media, usually you have to know someone who works in the media or you have to come from a particular type of family um, that can teach you the, the ropes or even you have to have like some kind of political backing. And to be honest with you, a lot of that is is actually true. And I mainly realized that when I was working in TRT World. So before TRT World, I was working in World Bulletin. It was a very small office. I think we had about four or five employees. I was pretty much the only guy that was managing the English site. So I didn't have to deal with any office politics there. It was very simple. The editor would say, write something, I'd write it, publish, done. Um, but when I entered TRT World um, a year later, so I was actually, I'd left World Bulletin. I was intending to come back to, the, to London. And then just when I was about to leave Turkey, TRT World opened up and um, then they weren't actually officially recruiting at the time. They weren't advertising a lot of their um, positions, but they were starting to build the foundations of a team. Um, so I had a friend who knew a um, lady. She's a Turkish journalist. She works for um, Daily Sabah now. Her name is Merve Shebna Morush. At the time, she was uh, running um, TRT World's um, digital team, the, the internet and social media side of things. Um, so... Um, my friend introduced me to her and, um, you know, I had a, a job interview, got the job. And this was when we were a very small team. So we were like the very first um, people to start TRT World's um, digital team. This was in 2000, okay. late 2014. Wow. We started off with about 10 people. And then in my four years that I was working there, those 10 people wound up turning into like 300 people. Um, so at first it was very simple. But then... Um, as the team started growing, you start getting egos, you start getting people on power trips, you start having people who are in there to fulfill a, a particular agenda, as in they're working for TRT World, but they're also actually working on behalf of someone else, as in um, politicians who are supporting them, 
or yeah. um, businessmen who are supporting them. Um, you have a lot of this in, in um, any big major news company. Um, and I wasn't prepared for that because um, I was a Turkish Cypriot in Turkey. I was a foreigner there um, by all means. Um, I didn't have any connections with Turkish political parties. I didn't have any connections with Turkish businessmen. I was just a, a person who went in there who loved Turkey, who wanted to serve Turkey by working for um, their state-owned public broadcaster. And um, I had no other agenda. Um, but then you have other people in there who have got an agenda. You have other people in there who have got political backing and you're competing with them. And sometimes, you know, you might think as, as a new journalist, you might think that, hmm, you know, I've got this really amazing, brilliant idea. Yeah. You'll pitch the story and the story will get rejected. And you'll have no idea why it's been rejected. Um, because, you know, you'll know and you know that other person also knows that it's a great idea. Um, but what you'll realize is that a lot of the time the story is either rejected simply because the company isn't ready for it or the, um, the country, the, the state of affairs or politics is not ready for such an article. Or it could be that they love the article idea. They love the pitch, but it can't come from you because of office politics. I see. Um, yeah. Do you have a lot of people in there who, I'm not just talking about TRT or any major news company, you have a lot of journalists in there who will look at you when, as soon as you start growing, as soon as you start, um, mm. you know, achieving things, a lot of people will start seeing you as a threat and um, as a disruption of a certain status quo, a certain power balance that is in the company. Um, so you don't want to raise your head too high above the trench, especially when you don't have uh, political backing. So that was uh, a struggle that I had to deal with on a, on a daily basis there. And it took me a long, long time to get used to that. And this is not something that they teach you, teach you in any journalism course or, or anything. This is something that you learn yeah. when you actually get into journalism. Um, so there were a lot of problems like that that um, I encountered. And um, even today with my own project, um, uh, the reason why I, I'm not making money from the project right now is because I'm actually trying to stay true to journalism. I'm actually trying to do it properly. I'm not working for anyone else's agenda. I'm not working for any, anyone else's business interests. So sometimes I'll write something that will make one person happy, another person upset, because it's the truth. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't make everyone happy. But no. then the, the person who I've made happy might get upset by another article that I've written because, um, you know, when, when you're doing that, when you're sticking to the truth, you wind up making a lot of enemies. You, you wind up making a lot of people. Yeah. There's a lot of people who start questioning, who do you really work for? Um, so it is difficult to grow. It is difficult to get sponsorship and investment. And, um, when, when you're a journalist sticking to the truth, um, it is extremely difficult. There's not a lot of money in it. Um, but on the other hand, if you want to be somebody who you're not really interested in the, in the truth, you're just interested in making money um, for other people and making money for yourself, there are ways that you can go about doing that in, in journalism. But I don't know if that's the reason why you're getting into journalism. I'd suggest that you just stay away. Yeah, I mean, um, it's very uh, commendable that obviously you were able to handle these situations and it's great that you're so open and honest about it. But I mean, what was your uh, tactic then? You know, when these things happened and you're upset, is it to just act like it's not happening or do you challenge it? Just very quick, without going into much detail, I mean, what would you advise people out there who are starting out in journalism? What do you think their reaction should be? Should they just turn a blind eye or should they, like you said, if they want to stay true to journalism, uh, stick to their guns and always try and deliver the truth? Which one would you prefer? I think I know which mm. one you would prefer, but how, how did you go about it? Well, my advice is for anyone who is able to go freelance, stick to freelance because that's the best thing ever. Um, you are your own boss. You decide what you write about. You decide who you pitch it who you pitch it to, and if you're able to do that, then great. Um, but not everyone has that luxury because in order to be freelance, um, you usually need some kind of steady income coming in from somewhere else. Um, so a lot of the freelance journalists that I knew in Istanbul, they were mainly foreigners, and 
the way they were surviving in Istanbul was they had a property in London or in America or wherever they were from, yeah. and they were renting that property out. And with that money, they were just surviving. So even when they were, weren't making money from journalism, they were getting by somehow. Um, yeah. So if you have that luxury, then yeah, by all means do it. But um, if, like me, you don't really have that luxury, um, you're going to have to wind up working for someone else. And there will be times where you'll be asked to do things that you don't agree with. You'll be asked to do things that you don't understand. And um, really, it's, you have to be very tactful. You have to know when you can attack and when you have to kind of step back and, and um, you know, give concessions. Um, so you need to decide that for yourself. Like, where do you draw where do you draw the line as a person, as a human being? Yeah. And um, throughout your journalism career, you will be asked that question. You will have to ask that question to yourself many times. Mm. It's not just one time. O over and over again, mm. you'll be put, put in that situation. Um, but at the end of the day, you have to keep in mind it's a job. And even if you don't agree with it, even if you don't understand it, if your employer is telling you to do something that's within your job description, it's your responsibility to do it. If you're not prepared to do it, then you have to um, accept that it's not the job for you and you have to resign, basically. Um, but there are occasions, it's not always black and white, there are occasions where um, your boss will give you something to do. And instead of criticizing it and saying it's a bad idea, what you can do is suggest improvements, suggest better ways. <laughs> you can discuss yes. the consequences of doing yeah. things one way or another. Um, so you have to learn the art of negotiation and compromise. Um, and there were many times where um, I had to do that, and I really took huge risks um, in doing that, but it, it pulled off many times. Um, I can give you one example where uh, there was a referendum in Turkey about um, reforming the constitution. And um, obviously when it's a referendum, you put out the, the question to the public, yes or no, and the public decides, you know, whichever one they're in favor of. Um, and in that referendum, the yes vote won by a narrow margin of like 51% to 49%. Um, so you have to keep in mind that there were 49% of people in Turkey who were not happy with the result. And what happened was we had a big shot from upstairs, um, you know, one of the senior um, decision makers of TRT World came down to the digital department and he's... As a, as a human being, he's quite partisan. So he immediately suggested, let's make the title of this story Victory for Democracy in Turkey. <laughs> um, and because he's so powerful in the company, you have a, you had a lot of people around him who were just like, yes, yes, I agree with that idea, you know? Um, yeah, yeah. And I was just thinking, I'm like, oh, my God, if we put this as TRT, as the state um, public broadcaster, if we put this headline, we will be antagonizing 49% of the country. So mm. um, I I was actually one of the, I think I was the only person that actually dared to break the silence and say, actually, I think that's a bad idea. I think um, we should just make it clean and just say um, constitutional reform package passes referendum in Turkey, something like that. Yes. And um, when I said that, a lot of people looked at me like, oh my God, you know, what are you doing? You know, they're going to fire you. And actually, to my own surprise, the person actually likes my idea. And then he changed his idea to match mine. Yeah. And then when he changed his idea, then everyone else changed their idea. Of course. You see, so you have to make those risks. But for me, like I was somebody that cared about journalistic integrity. I, I cared about my company that I was working for, about our reputation, and about my, you know, the country, Turkey. So. Um, Mm. I couldn't. I couldn't stay silent in that kind of situation. Um, so yeah, there are those kind of obstacles, and you just need to. You need to know yourself. Uh, you need to know what you're happy to do, what you're not happy to do. You need to know your politics and the country that you're working for, and the media company you that you're working for you need as to well. Know. I think be aware know. of your surroundings. Definitely. You Being need the, to know the, the now and the no. Yeah, you, for, really. you, you need to understand the power balance. Especially if you're working for like BBC yeah. or TRT or any kind of state broadcaster, you need to know who's representing what party. Um, you need to figure that out. No one's going to tell you. No one walks around with a sign on their head saying yeah. Ak Party or Jehepe. 
No, you have no, to figure you have that to out. out. Sometimes so people the first six just don't yeah. open your mouth. The first six months, don't open your mouth. Your mouth just go along with it. <laughs> yeah, and observe. That's a good piece of advice. Mm -hmm. We've got lots of supportive comments. Uh, Ertan Yusuf saying, great show. Abby, who's saying, saying, if the articles you write are the truth, you have nothing to worry about. Stay true to your beliefs. Very much so. And Jansef mm -hmm. Jamal saying, great interview. Um, great advice about uh, negotiation and compromise. Important in many careers. So really, this sort of brings us to my next question, which is what are some of your proudest moments in your career so far? Um, for me, I... I like human stories. I like to find the stories of people who um, are suffering, who are voiceless, and I like to give them a voice. Um, so the Palestinian cause is, is a typical example here. But the thing is, we already have a lot of people covering the Palestinian cause. I think they're doing a fantastic job. And I, I have nothing to add there, really. There's not really much I can do, much more than what's already being done. Um, but there are many other communities out there in the world, diasporas, that are very similar to Turkey Cypriots. Um, and no one's telling their story. So I like to find those stories and I like to bring them to the forefront. Um, one example is um, the Uyghur Turks of China. We've got 20 million oh, yes. Uyghur Turks of China. Three million of, mm -hmm. according to reports, three million of them are locked up in concentration camps. In um, The Chinese call it Xinjiang, but we call it East Turkestan. Um, this is a story that's, that it doesn't receive as much media attention as it deserves. It should. So when I was in Istanbul, I was making connections with the Uyghur community and um, I was hearing their story and I wrote a story actually for T-Vine about this. Um, a lot of my, my best yeah. stories, yeah. yeah. A lot of my best stories are, are in T-Vine, believe it or not. Yes. So um, I wrote that story. I got their story told. And also there's um, another story about Cretan Muslims. So we're talking about Muslims who are native to the island of Crete. Right. Which is a Greek mm -hmm. Now, this is a story is very, very interesting. These are actually Greek Muslims. They're not Turks. Yeah. We call them Turks, <laughs> but they're not Turks. They're Greeks. Their their names, they have Greek names. Their first language is Greek, but they're Muslim. And they're not migrants to Greece. They are Greek, like as in they're from Greek and um, Greece. Now, these people, 120 years ago, they were exiled from Greece. Why? Because they were Muslim. Because back then, being a Muslim meant you're a Turk. So the yeah. Greeks, when they, were, when they took over Crete, um, they exiled the, what they would call Turks. They exiled the Muslims. And these uh, Muslims, they went to Syria and Lebanon. Some went to Turkey. But in Syria and Lebanon, you have, still today, you have certain towns where the first language is Greek mm. and the people are, are, you know, they're Greek Muslims in those communi communities. Yes. Um, so I managed to track down a few of them who had um, moved to Cyprus. They were living in Limassol. They'd been living there for like 30 years. Um, I tracked down a few of them and I interviewed them about, you know, I just wanted to learn their story. And they told me a really interesting story about how many of them um, during the Syrian war that's been taking place for the last nine years, many of them have left Syria as refugees. And their first choice has been to go to Greece. Because the reason why is because mm. they think, hey, we're originally from Crete. Let's go back yes. to Crete. Put the deeds for our properties in our hand. Let's go claim our properties. Let's go get our citizenship. And let's live peacefully. And they have the right to do that, in my opinion, because that's where they're originally from. But when they got to Crete, they realized that actually the um, the Orthodox Church had taken over their properties 120 years ago. They no longer recognized the yes. deeds in their hand. And a lot of these people mm -hmm. have winded up as refugees in refugee camps as, as Syrians. So can you imagine that these people have yeah. gone back to their home country after 120 years and they've winded yeah. up in these squalid refugee camps on these deserted islands? And um, they're being told that they're foreigners. And the quote unquote the lucky ones get asylum. They get refugee status. Wow. But that's not enough. They should be getting they should be getting citizenship. They should be getting their land back or at least some kind of compensation. Um, that was not satisfactory for me. And they're not satisfied by the situation. So I, I managed to tell this story and 
you know, these are really proud moments for me. Yes. Um, and especially I make a, I get to introduce them to Turkish Cypriots as well. Yeah. So they they hear our story, I hear their story, and we form these bonds. And um, I've I've done this with many such diasporas. I've done it with the um, Turkish people of Western Thrace, which is um, the land border between Greece and Turkey. They're in Greece now. Um, these are they're not Turks that moved to Greece. They're Turks who are from Greece. You got two hundred thousand of them in Greece, in uh, four cities. So I went to visit them. And I spent time with them and I, I went to their villages and I had an amazing time there. And, um, you know, just going out and meeting people and learning their story um, and telling their story is uh, always very proud mo moments for me. They're very rewarding, definitely. Yeah. I think so. That's yeah. a great um, inspiring story that you've told us and obviously informing our uh, community as well about things that perhaps people wouldn't know very much about you're right mm -hmm. you know um there are pockets of communities out there where people quite don't realize what their heritage is and what their rights are so i think definitely these are sort of the unheard stories that need to be told so thank you very much for sharing that with us um what plans have you got now for the future then where do you go from here well, from here, I'm, I'm still looking to grow Radio East Med, as I mentioned um, at the start of the program. I'm hoping that um, to monetize it eventually, um, because I think it is a good idea and it's filling in um, a gap in the niche market that needs to be filled. Um, I've already got the support of a few people um, regarding my work, and surprisingly, a lot of Greek Cypriots like it as well. Um, within the Turkish Cypriot community, I've had mixed reactions because... Um, unfortunately, when you're tar targeting a global audience, you have to you have to use language in such a way that um, fits in with the global status quo. So I have no choice but to but to do that. But every opportunity that I get in a politically correct way, I do um, try to push Turkey Cypriot interests in in the way I write and in my message. Um, and a, a few Turkey Cypriots they they understand and they appreciate the um, difficult position I'm in and they show their support. Some of them, they don't quite understand. Um, yeah. But a lot of Greek Cypriots as well, by reading my work, are for the first time starting to understand the Cyprus problem from a Turkish Cypriot perspective. And I'm mm. not apologetic to them in any way. Um, I do not try to appease them or to give them any kind of concessions. But it's just the way that I tell the story. Um, or sometimes I'll write about something which is nothing to do with Cyprus, but from a Turkish Cypriot perspective, yeah. about how we look at things. And um, a lot of Greek Cypriots have been able to appreciate that. Um, a lot of Lebanese, Syrian, Turkish, Egyptian, Libyan, um, Greeks from, from Greece. And these are the, the areas that I'm focusing on. A lot of these people have started to appreciate my work. Um, uh, but really, in order to market it, to sponsors and investors and maybe crowdfunders, um, I need to show that it's worth it. So what I need is I need more followers on Twitter. I need more uh, likes. I need more retweets. Facebook, same thing. And um, first and foremost, I'm relying on my friends. Um, I have many a diverse group of friends from different countries um, with connections to journalists. Um, they can help me do this. I'm relying on the Turkish Cypriot community to help me do this, to boost the algorithm um, on social media. And um, what else? I'm, I'm depending. I mean, my friends have pulled through for me in the past. They've helped me made, make stories go global within 24 hours. So I know I, I do have those kind of people around me. Um, but I just need their help at the moment. So hopefully I'll get that. And I'm also thinking of um, putting together my own curriculum, my own workshops about um, introduction to journalism and um, that I can go around to schools and, and just teach and kids around 14 to 16 years old mm. about what it's like actually working um, in the media um, to help them prepare for, for university and, and for actually a, a possible career in the future. So I'm putting together a curriculum um, like that. So maybe by the time schools um, reopen in September, that might be ready. That's so uh, these are these are a few things I'm working on as well as other projects. Great stuff.
yourself. I mean, just to repeat, your radio is called Radio East Med. So people be listening to your podcast, to your radio and, um, you know, try and support, follow and share. Definitely, like you said, um, definitely, I think our uh, Cypriot community would benefit from hearing your uh, broadcasts. And also, obviously, the fact that you're interested in educating the young. And, you know, there isn't that many journalism courses in secondary schools I must admit being a secondary school teacher myself um, it's something that's sort of coming in but not at the forefront and I think as a subject like economics like business studies I think there should be journalism as well at that level to inspire um, our kids and also start to teach them um, how to think as a journalist how to be aware of their surroundings the politics um, how to word things as a journalist so I think you know it's a completely different thing to say English literature or English language, you know, so I think it should be a subject within secondary schools. I totally agree with that. Mm. And I think that's very commendable work if you can do that, especially again, as a young professional, young Cypriot professional, it's great to, you know, infuse and inspire our community. And it sort of leads me to my last question. And then we're going to look at our comments because I think, is that your dad, Ergun Karpazlu? Yeah. <laughs> He's ready to call it. We'll leave it to the end. We'll leave it to the grand finale um, to uh, read his comment, which is lovely. And he's in Cyprus, is he currently, or here? He's in Cyprus. He's in the Cyprus. village. So that's great that they're watching us from all the way in Cyprus. It's fantastic. And mm -hmm. um, what advice can you give to young Turkish Cypriots who want to follow a similar career path to you? What would you say to them? Um start following my work first of all um depends depends what type of uh, journalism they want to get into because look i've i've taken on the heavy stuff i've taken on geopolitics um it, it gets messy and at sometimes you know your life is is even at risk but that's part of that's part of the job you know um if you get that adrenaline rush from being in those situations um as in like i mean i've been in many situations i've been followed home um, I've had people writing me threatening messages, um, almost got kidnapped by PKK a few times. Um, I've been in those kind of situations. So if you are, if you get that rush, like I do, then by all yeah, means, okay. go for it. <laughs> take your precautions. Take yeah, your precautions. You're a bulletproof vest, number yeah. one. <laughs> um, and but, tell uh, your mother a uh, great big lies about uh, you're hearing fireworks yeah. from the bombs go off in the background. I love that story. I'm gonna. Exactly. I mean, if you ever told your mama whopper of a lie, <laughs> sorry, it's <just> fireworks, mom. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. Yes. So, um, I mean, That's there are other there are other types of journalism you can get into, like showbiz. Um, it's showbiz is is a favorite for for people who don't like to get involved in the messy politics of it all. Um, also, sports journalism. I think my my brother, he's only sixteen. He's starting to show an inkling towards um, sports journalism nowadays. So I'm trying to encourage him to um, follow that path. Um, unfortunately, he's in North Cyprus. Not a lot of sports going on over there. But hopefully, one day he can uh, break out of that bubble. Um, the advice is generally like, look, follow your dreams. Um, don't listen to anyone who tells you you can't achieve it. Um, be willing to take risks and, and make sacrifices. You're going to have to do that. I One major sacrifice I made was I left this country because I was from such a demographic in East London. We were very cut off from mainstream society. Um, yeah. We rarely got any kind of opportunities. A lot of my friends who I grew up with are still working in McDonald's, are still working in Foot Locker. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but, you know, when you're anyone who's in their early 30s would hope to achieve more than that, usually mm -hmm. by by the age. Um, so I love them all, but they they didn't take the risks um, required, and that's why they got stuck where they were. Don't ever be content with where you're with where you are now. Um, achieve a dream, achieve achieve a goal, and then set new goals. Keep growing, keep forcing your way up the ladder, and um, don't worry too much about. Um, not having the money. Um, when I came back to this country last year, I had about £3,000 and that was it. I didn't have a place to stay because I'd been out the country for so long. Um, I, you know, my parents had, had left and, you know, I didn't have any furniture. I didn't have, like, I just had two suitcases of clothes and a few books and that's it, you know. 
Um, but I came here with an intention to do my best to get things going. And since I've been growing, this, this year has been amazing. Um, and God provides, you know. Um, I say, if you are a believer in God, then you should trust in God. Um, he, he always provides a way. And if you're not getting um, a certain provision from where you're expecting it, where you're hoping to get it from, it means he's got other plans for you. you your, your provision is somewhere else. So keep seeking that provision. Um, and give yourself like a game plan as well. Um, know what you're aiming for and try to figure out how to get there. So spend time with other journalists. You know, journalists are not these um, very far up people that are unreachable um, unless they are the ones in the suits and ties standing outside of Washington. You know, even I can't get through to them. But in terms of like your citizen journalists, your freelance journalists, mm -hmm. um, I don't know, people who are writing for Vice News and places like that, people making documentaries, you can easily find them on social media. Follow their work, ask them questions, connect with them, um, follow in their footsteps. A lot of them are very responsive on social media. Um, and um, give, just ask for their advice, really. Um, a lot of them, you'll be surprised, they'll, they'll respond. Um, so my brother, as I said, he's, I think he's getting into sports photojournalism, to be precise. So um, I said to him, look, you know, is there, whenever you see a sports photo of a football match and you really like the photo, look up the, the photo journalist who took it. Um, you know, follow him on social media, get to know him, um, him or her, rather. Mm. And um, you'll, yeah. you'll be surprised. Like, this is actually the way to get into journalism. If you don't have those media contacts, you're going to have to make them. And that's the way to go about it. It's easier more today than, than ever. Definitely. Very good advice. Right, we're going to go through the comments. We've uh, gone over time, but it's been a pleasure, Ertan, as always. Um, you've been on my programme a few times, but never talking about your own personal career path. So mm -hmm. thank you very much for agreeing to do this. It's been a truly inspirational uh, interview. Um, your dad, Ergun Karpasa, has said, Londra'da bulunan kıpırsaların sesini duymak için güzel bir yayın. So basically, go on then, Ertan, translate that for us. Um, it's nice to hear um, the voice, let's say, of Turkish Cypriots in London. Yes. And Gulay has put... Uh, his profile picture. Yes. <laughs> Gulay <laughs> has put a brilliant idea. We need to inspire the next generation of Turkish Cypriots. Thank you, Ertan, for sharing your story. A real inspiration. And that's actually... Uh, Gulai, who's um, part of our team anyway, backstage, sometimes comes on. So, you know, that's uh, very nice of her to say that and very much the truth. Hussein Hoja, somebody that you uh, work with, with um, a lot of your Jezere work. Um, good advice there, San Carlos. So you have made your family and community proud. Thank you, Aisha, for these programs bring our UK born Cypriots to the forefront. Most definitely, it's a pleasure for me, really. And I think certainly, um, especially of our generation as well, you know, we, we've we sort of, you know, not really sort of spoken out uh, very much so. And I really think that we need to come to the forefront, you know, those in our 30s, 40s, who sort of second, third generation in this country, um, professionals, I think it's very, very important to inspire our younger um, audiences and, you know, say that it's okay to make mistakes, to persevere, to have grit um, and, uh, you know, carry on no matter what. Like you were saying about this year when you came back from Turkey, you know, uh, it wasn't the best of times. You had hardships, but you carry on. And like you said, if you have a belief in a higher being, certainly it does help. And uh, you make do somehow, somewhere, you get help and you move on, really. And it's great advice what you told us. Abi Hussain is put, how do you feel about Turkey and Russian positions um, about Libya? Do you want to answer that question? Um, it's up to you. You know, actually, this is a brilliant question because um, I'm just going to direct um, Abby to my podcast on Radio East Med. And um, every month what I do is I record myself on my phone, my phone's microphone, nothing too fancy, just speaking about developments in the Eastern Mediterranean. I spend about 10 minutes per topic. I usually pick about four topics a month. And then um, I put them up separately onto YouTube. Um, for those who are only interested in one particular topic. And then I do another one, which is like all four or five of them combined together. So it's like one long half an hour podcast. So I actually talked about this um, in, in one of my podcasts for this month. Let me just get you the name of it. 
of the particular yeah, one she's that just you're put, I'll follow you on twitter by the way and it was did i read that yeah. right it was russian positions about libya by the way but yeah so she's following you mm -hmm. yes so I'll, I'll give you the name of that podcast i'll show you the picture of it, of it as well um it's called bear with me one moment it's fine yeah libya's warring sides heading for stalemates permanent division and i'll show you a picture of it as well so if you can find um so if you can find this on my website it's radioeastmed.com um it's about 10 minutes long it's a little podcast you can listen to my opinion from there um because this isn't re this isn't really the show to go into very deep geopolitics um i can't sum that up in one minute um so if you want to learn about that then please go onto my website find that um okay. that episode and uh, just listen to it from there for sure and it's a he not yeah. a she sorry apologies you're if you're a yeah. he <laughs> but it's all the same here everyone welcome he's and she's are welcome to comment on my mm -hmm. program so thank you very much for all your support and um obviously they will be following you on twitter and like you said obviously your podcast will go into more detail um with that but thank you very much Ertan, for coming on my program it's been an absolute pleasure you, you're an inspiration to our community and keep up the good work and uh you know, it's just been great hearing your story, a very unusual story. And you've uh, done a lot for your uh, young life, really, so far. So I'd be quite interested um, in the next five years, what happens to Ertan Karpaz? So you've got to come on and tell us what the future is. And, you know, maybe we can look back on this um, broadcast and see where you are in five years time. I think that would be great to see. Yeah, well, if I'm not being held hostage somewhere by a terrorist group, then, yeah, I'll definitely do that. <laughs> I'm sure you yeah. are. Thank you very much, Edward. It's been a pleasure. Thank yeah. you very much to our viewers for all the comments. That's it from us from Eurogench TV. Have a good evening. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Welcome, we are Bologna, calling newlyweds or those looking for a new bedroom set. Venti five door bedroom set is not only glamorous and modern, but has storage inside the bed. This bedroom set was £3,700, now £2,395. Bologna, we are here for you.